Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I really wish I could have been there in person, but uh, unfortunately, uh, travel is still a little elusive, uh, at least to Canada at this point in time. Nevertheless, uh, I'm really happy to be here. This is my first ever talk at NorthSec, and I'm really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, getting some questions and comments on the talk that I have as well. Um, so I'm going to quickly get to it because I have 30 minutes and I don't have too much time and I, my talk is uh, loaded with a lot of content. So I'm going to quickly start sharing my screen. Um, I'm guessing everyone is able to see my screen. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I, I think you're... Yeah, I'm, I'm presenting from one screen. So I'm. Uh, this is unlike probably most speakers who are going to be doing it remote. I'm just going to start my slide deck and I'm going to get started. Um, all right. So uh, this talk actually is a culmination of uh, a bunch of research efforts from 2021 uh, that uh, is now being showcased uh, all over. So this is called hook, line, and sinker pillaging API webhooks. Now, webhooks are something that uh, a lot of us use, and I'm sure members of this audience as well are quite familiar with what webhooks are. We're going to quickly get into what it is and how it works and all of that stuff. And then I'm going to be looking at attacking it and some case studies around how we actually went about this particular piece of research. So uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Abhay. I work for a company called V45. And I'm also, uh, uh, I'm also the chief research officer of AppSec Engineer. We run a training platform on AppSec, cloud security, Kubernetes, and so on. Uh, I do a lot of training. I do a lot of talking. Uh, I do a lot of research on mostly defensive stuff. So this this talk actually is a departure from my typical style of talks, which is way more defensive than uh, offensive. So most of my research is defensive, but in this case, the talk I'm going to be focusing on is explicitly offensive. So I'm going to get started uh, with it. Uh, if you're interested, we have a very interesting YouTube channel where you can check out a lot of interesting stuff on AppSec and so on. And if you want to check out my blog, that's there as well. I highly encourage you ask your questions on Twitter because I am currently suffering from a uh, back injury and I'm not going to be there for a Q&A session on, on the uh, NotSec channel. So if you want to ask questions, please uh, reach out to me on Twitter. I'm going to respond. I'm barely holding it together, sitting and talking right now, just on a lot of pain meds. So that's, I just wanted to let you know that if you want Q&A, please reach out to me on Twitter. That's the best way that I can respond to you. All right. So my talk today is going to be full of memes. Uh, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many uh, presenters use memes in, in NotSec, but my talk is going to be nauseatingly full of memes. And I have one live demo as well. So I am going to have to pray to the demo guy. And I'm going to have to ask all of you to pray to the demo gods on my behalf so that everything works. Because live demos as they go, a lot of things can go really, really wrong. So I'm hoping that everything goes pretty well. I did test it before I just started. But, you know, things can go wrong uh, every single time. So you never, never really know. Anyway, today's agenda is going to be pretty quickly. Uh, what are webhooks? How do they work? We're going to get into this pretty quickly. I have 30 minutes, so I'm not going to take too much time in the explanatory segments. We're going to be looking at some common webhook attack patterns. And this attack is not in the common webhook attack pattern. So the attack that I'm going to be referring to in this specific uh, presentation is not a very commonly seen attack. But I think it has the potential to really uh, explode on the scene. We've seen it explode on the scene, uh, at least uh, with the kind of bug bounty targets that we've been working with. It's, it's really uh, performed uh, really well against a lot of these targets. We're going to do a quick introduction to SSRF because that's the underpinning of this. And SSRF, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of SSRF, probably uh, do a lot of SSRF as part of your offensive work or even do uh, defend against SSRF, in which case I pity you. But nevertheless, SSRF is something that we're going to be focusing on. This talk is a lot about SSRF. We're going to look at SSRF. We're going to look at a new class of flaws that we dub webhook boomerang flaws. Now, these flaws have been there. There are They've been in and around, but they've not been as well exploited, I think, as they could have been. So this is where we're going to be talking about. This is the meat of the uh, presentation. And then I'll talk about some sub-variants and so on. Right. 
So basically, when you are building an API, the first thought you have is interaction, right? You want to respond to events. And one of the big things when you are building an API is to respond to events. So when a new user is created or when there's a new customer that signs up or a new payment that comes in or you know, blah, 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 whatever it is, you are typically dealing with events, right? APIs, especially with APIs, you have a lot of events that you want to deal with. And a lot of times, when you are dealing with events, you need webhooks because you need to post that event somewhere. So let us say I'm a new e-commerce, uh, you know, I'm a new e-commerce merchant and I have set up a new site on whatever and I'm using Stripe or Shopify or what have you. Now, in that case, the first thing that I'd like to know is, hey, when am I getting paid? Have I gotten this customer? When have I gotten this customer? So webhooks makes it really, really powerful way for your API to start reacting to these events. So when a new customer is created, you can send a webhook to Slack and say that, hey, a new customer signed up or you received payment of this. Webhooks make all of that possible, right? So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of webhooks. Most of you are probably dealing with webhooks on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of you are probably writing uh, a lot of webhooks as well. Now, so webhooks basically are user-generated callbacks. So I set up a webhook, uh, so I'm a user, and I set up something called a consumer. So I say that, you know what, whenever a new user is created on my e-commerce store, I want you to make a webhook request to my consumer app. So I've written this app somewhere here, and I want you to make a request to that So uh, with a particular JSON that says that this user with this email, with this whatever other information is signed up. So in a webhook transaction, there are typically two uh, entities that are involved. One is the provider, which would be your Shopify or Stripe or what have you, any of the these providers that are reacting to the events. And then there would be a consumer that would actually be receiving that event and saying that, or, and they're using it for processing whatever they need to process, right? So this is a very common uh, setup that you have. So these are essentially user-generated callbacks, right? So that's how webhooks work. So uh, in this case, we have a webhook setup when, whenever a new user is created, uh, there is this uh, event that is triggered that uh, hits the consumer. The consumer app essentially uh, uses that to maybe store it or send them an email or process it forward or whatever they need to do, right? So these are basically how webhooks work. Now, webhooks are literally everywhere, right? Now, you'll see webhooks in not only apps like Stripe and Zapier and uh, Shopify and all of that jazz. You see this all over the place. You see this with Kubernetes. You see that with CI CD systems. Uh, you see it with CI CD systems, I would say, use them extensively, right? Any kind of build systems or CI CD tool use webhooks all over the place. Even basic, uh, even apps that are related to marketing automation and so on use webhooks extensively. Anything that needs to integrate with a whole bunch of other applications, especially through event driven workflows, webhooks are the number one way to do that. And it's very popular, very commonly seen pattern that you do. In fact, companies like Zapier, I'm sure you've realized also they run their entire business on top of running webhooks or triggering webhooks as consumers and providers, depending on uh, who they are in the piece of the transaction. Now, common webhooks are uh, trades, at least they're event driven. They're typically post request, which is basically post JSON. Of course, you still have the odd XML one, but most of them today are post JSON, which means they post JSON uh, to the consumer. Uh, they also, uh, you know, they also are sometimes protected by HMAC or API keys with an HTTP header. So just to ensure that the webhook consumer is somebody that is actually legitimate, they also make, uh, you also need to authenticate the uh, transaction through an HMAC or an API key, depending on the kind of webhook. Sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. It really depends on the provider and the kind of configuration the provider is using. And of course, in some cases, uh, in some cases, remember, especially in the case of build tools or CI CD tools, you will see that producer systems allow you to add your own custom header. So let's say you need to add an API key for your system or your application, which is your consumer application. You can set up a webhook with additional headers as well. You, it's not only that you may, you just give, the, give it a URL, you might also be able to add your own custom header so that uh, you can actually uh, get your uh, in event and that would be identified with this HTTP header with, with a bunch of custom headers, right? So that's basically what the common webhook traits are. Now, if you come to think of it, the, the natural type of uh, assumptions or attack focus that one would have. So let's say you're a pen tester or somebody doing offensive security on a webhook. 
the natural assumptions would be that let's uh, let's let's try and compromise the consumer most of the attacks are trying to compromise the consumer right and to prevent other kind of replays and things like that again most of it is trying to compromise the consumer so can i compromise the consumer with a deserialization payload which means that let's say i put in some kind of malicious json or yaml or whatever it is can i run my code on the consumer can i compromise a whole bunch of consumers you know with an ecosystem style attack can i tamper with the payload can can the consumer detect tampered payload can i replay the attacks can i uh, attack from unknown sources so it depends on uh, whether uh, you know it is uh, whether the consumer is making the sorry the provider can make random requests to uh, another consumer so a lot of these are typical attack scenarios that you come up with right so these are typical attack scenarios that you see and a lot of them and a lot of you i'm sure do this as well so when you're trying to uh, can you do a replay can you run the same transaction a whole bunch of times is there a way for the consumer to detect that it's a replay happening so all of these things are natural attacks but in our case what we're going to do is going to we're, we're kind of flipping the script in this case what we're trying to do is can i compromise the provider our focus today and our focus in this entire class of attacks is can i compromise that provider this provider that is sending me the event payload can i compromise that particular provider through some type of attack so basically what i'm trying to do in this case is that i have a provider which is my you know stripe shopify what have you i mean i'm i'm just using them as examples i'm not saying that they're vulnerable please keep that in mind so whatever i have this provider now this provider makes a request obviously sends this http request uh, to the consumer now the consumer in turn instead of processing this legitimately like a normal or a good consumer would the consumer makes a request or somehow finds a way of attacking and compromising the provider and the internal applications of that provider it could be a database it could be an internal application it could be metadata it could be whatever now as soon as you think of a scenario like this i'm sure the first thing that comes to mind is naturally ssrf right now ssrf is one of those attacks that orients itself towards doing something like this right because ssrf allows you to redirect or facilitates a redirect based on a user controlled url so in this case it has all the natural uh, makings of a classic ssrf attack the idea here is that when i the user can uh, can uh, use a particular url of my choosing so it could be a url that i can select or i can enter or i can use as part of the attributes and i can get this application this target or victim application to make a, an internal request to one of their internal urls or to a metadata url so let's say i want to compromise aws credentials i make a call to a metadata url and that metadata url gets uh, i get access to the credentials and from there i get those credentials and then start exfiltrating information uh, from aws i can escalate privileges on top of your aws account so this is ssrf this is classically ssrf right most of us are aware of this most of us have seen this ssrf is super common you see this in nearly uh, every third bug bounty report uh, at least uh, is uh, i mean i obviously don't have the exact stats but ssrf is super popular it's very very commonly seen now you see of course ssrf you have a lot of uh, attacks the capital one breach where uh, the attacker was able to find ssrf on the mod security uh, mod security deployed by capital one they were able to use that get the uh, make a call to the internal 169.254.169.254 aws metadata they were able to get the credentials those credentials had a, a large scope access to the amazon s3 infrastructure that was run by capital one and they were able to gain access to all those s3 uh, buckets and uh, exfiltrate a whole bunch of uh, user information from there then of course you've constantly seen this ssrf is super common you've seen this as part of the proxy logon exploit chain it is one of those one of those extremely common and extremely popular attacks that is also hard to prevent by the way it's not very easy to prevent ssrf there are a lot of different nuances to prevent ssrf anyway so the idea here is that with ssrf you can do all of this stuff one of the the reasons why ssrf has become so popular is because ssrf is used extensively to compromise cloud environment so if you are running kubernetes or aws or azure or gcp the idea here is that you have some metadata url or metadata file path 
and you can ca uh, access that particular file path gain access to sensitive credentials that are mounted on that particular file path or url and then use that to escalate privileges into the account ssrf can also be you reading a remote file and executing that through a remote code execution it can be denial of service it can be information disclosure so through ssrf i'm able to access internal hosts and those internal hosts have sensitive information that could be information disclosure so you have a wide array of possibilities with what you can do with ssrf so i'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. Now here, what we want to do is leverage SSRF against our provider. So we want to use this attack essentially as a boomerang. So what we want to do is to say that, look, hey, uh, the provider is going to make a request to me, the consumer. I am an evil consumer and I, I get a request through the provider. Now I want to be able to use that same request chain against the provider. Right. So I want to redirect a request back to the provider where I do something, where I'm able to compromise internal assets. So I'm, the idea here is that my provider makes a webhook request, whereas my consumer redirects that particular request back to an internal URL or metadata or what have you. And I'm able to compromise that as part of this. Now, remember, a lot of times the reason that this also works is because a lot of these providers store previous results of webhook execution, right? So for instance, let's say I'm, a, I'm Stripe and every single time I receive a payment, I trigger a webhook or I've, uh, the user has configured a webhook where I can trigger a webhook on this particular, on this particular event. Now I keep a log of those uh, uh, the requests and responses. So Stripe maintains a log of that and, and a lot of times you as the user are able to see that log. So the idea here is that the consumer, who is also a legitimate user of the application, wants to leverage this attack and then use the webhook that they have set up to compromise that provider application or that victim application. Right? That's basically what they want to do. But there is also a problem. Now, if you are familiar with SSRF, you'll know that SSRF works extensively with GET requests. Right? SSRF works when there is a GET request involved. So when you take a GET request and you are able to uh, use another GET request, you can do SSRF, you can manage SSRF. However, most of the webhooks, right? Most, uh, I'm not saying all, but probably close to all. Most webhooks make POST request or PUT request, right? Because they are sending data. They're not only making a GET request. There's no point of a GET request. Most of the time they are making POST requests because they're posting JSON to that particular uh, consumer, right? So the idea here is that you're getting a post request, but how do you use that to make a, uh, to redirect that into a get request? That's So it's hard to weaponize, especially with pure SSRF. So this is where a very interesting header comes in. Now there's a, there's a header, which is a, uh, which is a very popular, not, I wouldn't say very popular, but at least a well-known redirect header, which is called the HTTP 303 redirect. Now the way this works, is that if you send it a post or a put, this redirects as a get. So you can set up a redirect on your consumer application that says, hey, whenever you get a post request to this particular path, let's say whatever, slash webhook, whatever, you need to 303 redirect it. Now a 303 redirect automatically converts that post request to a get request on the redirect and it requests a particular new location. And that is where this really works. This attack really works because 303 converts that redirect into a get request and sends it back to wherever you have redirected it. Now, obviously people creating the standard didn't imagine that this would be the case or this would be how it would use, but 303 allows that to happen, right? Unlike most other uh, redirects that you have. So, uh, so the idea here is that the re in a response, so whenever you have a HTTP 303, which is see other, it essentially says, hey, this way, please, and makes it a get request. So basically redirects it as a get request, and your clients essentially just follow along. They just said, oh, okay, I need to redirect to this location, so I'm going to make a get request to this particular location, and that request turns now into a get request now, which means that you can leverage that SSRF in full uh, scope, right? So this is something that 303 allows you to do. So what we want is essentially, we want our provider application, we want this webhook request to come in, 
And once this webhook post request hits my consumer, the consumer, remember, the consumer is another web application that's just listening for these requests. So as soon as this post request comes in, this sends back an HTTP 303 that redirects to an internal metadata service like 169.254 or some local host service or some internal IP address or whatever it is that it's able to access that URL and get whatever information, whatever uh, response that comes from that particular URL get request is stored as part of the webhook logs, right? So that, that's the idea. So the attacker wants to be able to do this because the attacker wants to be able to store, uh, 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 redirect, boomerang this attack back to the provider, get that provider to talk to an internal metadata service, steal credentials, and then use that in the webhook logs, use those stolen credentials and escalate privileges into their AWS account, or use that to access an internal resource or what have you, right? There are a whole bunch of things that you can potentially do with this. Now, this is something that uh, we have extensively used against a whole bunch of public bug bounty targets. Wherever we've seen uh, bug bounty system, wherever we've had bounty programs, we have uh, tried this out and it has had amazing results. The, the kind of results that we've seen with the webhooks system that they had have been quite amazing. And we have used this on Docker, and we were we were able to use this successfully on Docker, right? Now, Docker, obviously, as all of you, I'm sure a lot of you use Docker every day. Docker uh, is a massive service that allows you to host your container images in their container registry. Docker was the original registry. Of course, now you have a whole bunch of other registries. But we were able to do this on Docker. We, we were able to compromise and gain complete access to their uh, whatever their AWS credential provided, which was quite uh, highly scoped at this particular point in time. So I'm going to explain how we did this. Now, in Docker, in Docker Hub, there is a functionality where you can create your own webhook, right? So we created a webhook uh, in this case, and we set up the webhook to a ngrok URL, uh, to, uh, to a URL that we controlled, of course. And behind the scenes, we essentially wrote a small piece of code that said, hey, you know what? Whenever you uh, whenever you get a request, a post request here, what we want you to do is run a 303 redirect back to uh, you know 169.254.169.254 slash latest slash metadata, which is a very common uh, path for the metadata in an AWS EC2 instance, or not only EC2, but any many other compute instances of AWS. We're talking about. Uh, Elastic Beanstalk, we're talking about uh, Fargate. I think Fargate has a slightly different IP address, but uh, it's pretty much the same idea regardless, right? So, uh, but it is essentially gets you access to the instance metadata on that particular node. And through that, we were able to identify this. So once we did this, we pushed. So this webhook would be triggered every time we pushed a new container image to this particular uh, to this particular Docker registry, uh, Docker repository, right? So we pushed this uh, container image, which was gen generally a, a random container image. And once we did that, we saw that the Docker hub, the webhook trigger, the Docker hub uh, essentially was triggering the webhook, of course, but we were not able to get the webhook uh, logs. We were not able to get the log of the webhook. And when we actually saw the requests and responses, we found the webhook log in the request. It was not being shown up on screen, but we found the uh, webhook log. And in the webhook log, we found that they used a uh, metadata credential, the AWS role name called this, right? So prod, whatever, whatever, or something. They used some AWS role name here. And once we were, once we used that particular URL in a subsequent request, we were able to dump the AWS credentials. And as it so happens, those AWS credentials were related to their EKS infrastructure that they were used, they used to run Docker Hub with. So the EKS infrastructure and probably a lot more, we didn't go beyond this because obviously we wanted to report it as soon as possible in the interest of uh, vulnerability disclosure. So in, as soon as we found this and we, and of course they mentioned to us that this was scoped to their EKS cluster on Amazon. And uh, obviously this means that this could have been a much larger attack because the Docker hub, which is which contains a lot of the base images and the trusted images potentially, I don't know, maybe they could have been compromised as well. So the idea here was those AWS credentials we were able to identify and using those AWS credentials, we were able to access their AWS account. We were uh, able to potentially compromise their AWS account 
and uh, gain access to whatever scope that particular role and that particular privileges granted to that role could provide us. So this was a huge attack simply because Docker is, as you all know, an extremely public uh, service that all of us use. Uh, and this could have had a pretty huge impact. So we immediately reported it to them. Uh, in fact, we just did a get caller identity and it was giving us a legitimate uh, role on their AWS account. So we were immediate, we immediately reported it to them. And uh, they, of course, they fixed it in a matter of about two hours. As soon as we reported it, a couple of hours later, they said that we'd fixed it. We re-ran the checks and we had found that they had actually indeed fixed it. So that is one of the things uh, we found. And thankfully, it was fixed quite a while back. So it's quite, uh, this is not uh, something that uh, we need to worry about anymore. So they were able to address it almost immediately. So uh, we have, I have a quick demo that I have set up here as well. I'm going to quickly run this. Now, if you see here, uh, we have our application. So I'm just going to quickly walk you through how the demo works or the demo app. So I have a provider application, as you can see here. And I have my evil webhook consumer that I've set up. Now, every time I make a webhook uh, post request payload, when I trigger a post request payload here, my evil consumer would HTTP 303 with a redirect to a CouchDB database. So CouchDB is a very popular NoSQL database that you can directly access through HTTP like a REST API. So I, the idea here is that I'm going to use this to access my data internally on the CouchDB. So CouchDB should not be exposed, but because I'm redirecting it and because this application has access to CouchDB, the idea here is to get this application to connect to CouchDB and store those results as part of the uh, webhook request and response uh, framework, right? So now let's quickly go into this. I've already set up the uh, demo. I am running my my application stack here. So this I'm running on our training platform on AppSec Engineer, in fact. So uh, now let's, uh, I think I've already set up everything I need to. I'm just going to log in and explain how the attack. So I have, I'm going to log in as the user. So this is me logging in as the user and I get a JWT or a, you know an authentication or authorization token once I have logged in as this particular user, right? So. Uh, if I do an echo dollar talk, I get this, right? So if I if I just paste it here, it's a genuine jot that I can use on my application. So in this application, so you'll see that it's a valid JWT, blah, 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 has, it's logged in, right? Now I am going to list the user's data. So I'm going to list the user's information as part of my application. So the user in this case has uh, set up a webhook and this webhook makes a post request whenever a new build happens. So imagine that this is a CI CD system and a new build happens, this triggers a request to my, um, uh, to this particular URL, right? So that's basically what happens. Now I'm gonna quickly uh, simulate this. I'm gonna simulate uh, a request. In this case, what I'm gonna do is here, I have set up my webhook. Now, in my webhook, what I have done is I have set up my redirect URA to uh, the uh, CouchDB uh, service. So I have said that whenever you're trying to do this, redirect it internally to a CouchDB instance. So uh, make a 303 request back to the CouchDB instance, right? I've just set it up as a redirect. So if you see my code, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll see that every single time a request comes in, make a 303 redirect to this URL, this hook URL that I've set up, right? So that's basically what's happened. So I'm going to run my uh, hook. This is me running my webhook, uh, my malicious webhook. And once I make a request, which is basically like, I'm going to trigger an event. You'll see once I trigger an event, this, this comes back with the CouchDB uh, all databases information. So if I see what is actually returned by this, you will see that the CouchDB database hack, uh, has a database called users. Now, if I change this request URL, uh, hook URI, and I instead of all databases, I make this users. Now, this is me escal escalating privileges, 984 slash user slash 
all docs. Sorry about that. Turn three. So every time my hook is reconfigured to redirect to another location. So in this case, now if I trigger another webhook event, you will see that it fetches. Oops. I'm not sure what happened. I, I think there is something wrong with the URL that I was trying to access. Oh, that was the issue. Sorry. Looks like I have added some unnecessary characters here. And so let me just rerun the the webhook simulation. Yeah, yeah, I think I already have it here. So you'll see that it, it returned with a whole bunch of characters. So if I do echo, I wish I'd just done a JQ here. So you'll see that it returned all these user values, right? So these are just user IDs, but of course I can fetch pretty much anything at this particular point in time. Now, so this was the demo of how this would work, right? Now, of course, one of the common things is, okay, this is a get request. What's so great? Yeah, in many cases, you, if you have metadata, a lot of times those metadata, uh, to access cloud metadata, if it's not AWS, in many cases, you have to add additional headers. But a lot of times you will see that a lot of services allow you to add custom headers, right, to the webhook. So in that case, one of the things you can do is add custom headers. So in this case, we were able to compromise a CI system where they were using GCP. And because we were able to add custom headers, we were able to simulate a system where we were able to add the metadata flavor header, which means that this would make a get request to the GCP metadata with that mandatory HTTP header, which is metadata flavor Google. And through that, we were able to still perform this attack. So if you have a webhook system that allows for custom headers, you have that possibility as well. Uh, I don't think, I think I'm, I've run out of time. Now, I'm just going to quickly run through the defense. Uh, the first thing you have to do is, one of the simplest things that you should do for this is to not follow redirect. So when you have a webhook set up, when you're, when you're using APIs and when you're using webhook functionality, the first thing you have to uh, do is turn off follow redirect on your HTTP client. Uh, that, it, that would essentially bring down the possibility of this attack by quite a bit. You have to figure out what type of HTTP client you're using and not follow redirect in that particular HTTP client. So that's something that you have to do. Of course, you can add additional uh, security elements like network security policy. You can add DNS so that... Uh, it does not resolve to a local internal IP address. You can add a validating uh, validation for the webhook URL, although that's a little difficult to do if you have a publicly uh, public uh, where, where users are providing their own URLs. So that may be difficult to do. Or you might have an IP deny list to say that anything that tries to talk to 169.254 or local host or 10 series or whatever it is, you do not allow that in your webhook URL. So these are some of the areas of defense that you can use. Um, that's really it. Conclusions, again, uh, webhooks are a very powerful way to integrate. But again, with these kind of boomerang attacks, you can have a very serious set of issues with webhooks. So definitely look at those possibilities and consider this as part of your threat model. I think the first thing you should do is consider this as part of your threat model that really makes it a lot more uh, powerful for you to think about these type of attacks and how you can uh, potentially get hosed by these kind of attacks. So that's something You'll see SSRF, of course, is the attacker's very good friend in this particular case. Uh, with that, I come to the end of my talk. I'm, I realized that it was probably a little rushed, but I hope I was able to convey uh, everything I wanted to convey. Uh, and I hope it was useful. Thank you so much for having me. And that's really it.